Good afternoon, gang. Welcome to our week three 160 session. What we'll do is, and I'll jump into screen sharing right now. This is a screen grab of the email I sent everyone. We'll take a look, and I don't think we'll be there all that long, at project two and three. There are a couple of things I'd like to touch on with project two, just to make sure everybody's very clear about how to very quickly get rid of all outlines on whichever of the two, of the three, sorry, illustrations you had to grayscale, of the two of them that you choose to work on. And then I just kind of like to break down some of those illustrations into where you can consider putting contrast, like contrast areas. There's a background, a middle ground, and a foreground. So if we sort of break our illustration or the composition into those three areas, we start looking at the we can start looking at the depth in each one of those areas. I know I have about oh, a dozen project twos to look at, and then I have some other illustrator files I, that have been coming in over the last like day and a bit. So I have to get caught up with a bunch of those tomorrow. Now with our illustrator projects gang, let's keep in mind all you have to do to submit those is just send me the unzipped illustrator file as an attachment. You don't have to uh, package that up. Only reason you package that up is if you had brought in other images and you had placed them without linking. Oh, maple syrup. Yeah, maple syrup, boy, go into the store with a healthy loaded debit card and a lot of cash. Oh, we'll go back here to now the um, packaging. You don't need to package up. I don't see why we would need to package up our Illustrator file. Unless you've done something fancy, just send me, which nobody's doing here. There's no reason to do this. Just send me your Illustrator file as an unzipped email attachment. If you had four Illustrator files to send me, you can... You can send one email with multiple single files in it, but we only have one file. So looking ahead, when you send me Illustrator files, an unzipped email attachment is all you need. And in a lot of cases, I've been able to, for people that have done that, reply to you directly in that email you sent me with screen grabs. So it's very easy for us to communicate that way. For our InDesign projects, that's totally different. That's where you have to package the document up then zip that package document and send that to me through WeTransfer. Okay, so that's the 120 class. So we'll take a look at uh, addressing some of the questions you may have for projects two and three. We'll give everybody some good traction there. Make sure that once we move on to something new here today, that you can easily go back and tackle projects two and three. So if the screen sharing, great. If you have you know, any verbal questions, great. Because from there, we're going to jump straight into Photoshop. And it's intro Photoshop, but there's a nice project that's going to tie us into some color moving ahead here. And we're going to go from, and I've supplied all the content we need for this. And it's, we're, what we're going to do is take a color that has predominantly warm colors in it. And we're going to convert this into a cool image. And it'll take us into a couple basic filters, some selections, layer masks, some really, really standard 101 need to know tools and features in um, Photoshop. But by the time we finished, we'll have a picture that looks like it was taken in spring or up in a mountain hill, but certainly not winter. So we'll take the warm colors and we'll convert and change those to cool colors. So we'll go from oranges and yellows and reds to blues, greens, that sort, sort of thing. So, and we'll familiarize yourself with some of the selection tools and uh, brush tools some, and some of the filters and working with layers, the basic essential stuff in Photoshop. I can appreciate there could easily be many people in the class who have never touched Photoshop in their lives. And that's fine. This is not an intermediate or an advanced class whatsoever with Photoshop. We need to be able to work with color and the tools in Photoshop. So this project I found from experience is a nice gateway into learning some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the basic tools. And I've supplied everything we need to know uh, and work with for this project. Let me take a look at it in a little bit uh, for successful completion of this project. 
Uh, if anybody here is familiar with Photoshop and has some experience, you'll understand what I'm, I'm highlighting here about selections, layers, filters, blending modes, hue and saturation, non-destructive editing, editing and saving files. So non-destructive editing means we are not creating any physical changes on the original artwork. We're working with other layers or adjustment layers, this sort of thing, but we are never editing the actual real physical content. So that's non-destructive editing. How many people here, well, anybody here have some experience in Photoshop where you worked with layer masks before and selections and moving content? And most people have for sure. Photoshop's been around since, oh, like the late, early 90s, late 80s. There's, a, there's something new you can learn about Photoshop every single day. And still, you might claim to be an expert like five years later. There's so much you can do with it. It's crazy. And there's so many different combinations of working with the tools and many all these different paths you can take to get to these different visual results. It's incredible. It's a lifelong learning session. Have you guys ever heard of a fellow named Bert Monroy? I'm going to hide this. I don't care about the weather. That one's not important. Here, we'll go over here to Bert Monroy. Bert Monroy, he's one of those guys, and he's a Photoshop guy. He's, he was best known way back at the beginning of the early days of Photoshop. And I remember working with Photoshop before they even had the layers. He was known as, he's one of the early Photoshop experts. What you're looking at here, these are old Photoshop bits of work. None of these are photographs. This stuff is all created from scratch within Photoshop. He was that skilled. This is some of his old work. So these are just little quick little visual indications of, you know, what you can do. I mean, you can do anything in Photoshop. And this happens to be his choice to go in something that's hyper-realistic. Beautiful stuff. You have all these other images here where pretty nice. But the countless number of layers, like some of these have 10,000 layers in them. And they're, you know, a gig in size or more. But very nice stuff. And we're certainly not going to be doing anything like this. I just thought it would be interesting to get a sense of some of what the Bert is capable of himself of doing and what the program can do in this general you know, direction. So Fog City, and here's some other bits and pieces of his work. But if you ever look for Bert Monroy, you'll come across his um, material very quickly. Now, oh, what's this? It's very recognizable stuff. So one of the early experts way back when. So let's go back here. And jumping now back into Blackboard. Before we get into our week three module, our week three, four module for the next project, Let's take a look at some project two material here. So our, our project, sorry, project four, which would be Photoshop. We're looking at project two right now in project three. Does anybody have, well, um, before I even ask that, I'm gonna sort of show a couple of the areas that I think we need to be aware of moving forward. There's been some great submissions so far for this assignment. Now so I'll scroll down to just something that's really obvious. Uh, Right here, for example, you can see there's a background element that's very blurred. You do not have to have just one area in the cloud in the background, say, if you choose Island Road to be blurred, you can take that entire background bit of content, which are going to be in this example, all the clouds, anything in that background, you can really, really blur those out quite heavily. The middle ground is where all the trees would be. And then the foreground is where we have this sort of little land mass. This composition has only five shades of gray in it. 
for those of you that have worked on the project, you know it's a tougher road to travel with the fewer grays in our palette. And the reason we're doing uh, working on a project like this is it's making us think about the decisions we're going to make in regards to where are the foreign, middle, and background elements here? What's the primary area of focus? How can I use depth of field with a little blurring to direct my eye into some other area in this uh, composition? The mountains here in the background are very blurred out, but because we're working with, you know, 10 shades today, it could be five. We can really blur those out and then make the four, the middle ground elements of the trees really pop. So we've, this person here has decided that the trees are going to be really important to take a look at. So let's soft focus the background big time, just like the sky here in Island Road. So the palm trees in Island Road have a lot more shapes in them. So there's a little more complexity there. And since you only have five grays to work with, you have to sort of cherry pick where you're going to add those grays. You can see the tips of some of these, some of the leaves in the background looks like the tips of the trees that you would think would be in the back further. They've been blurred. So it's a good eye for detail. And then in the foreground, sometimes we only have a couple of shades of gray here, but in some cases I've seen that totally whited or blacked out, which is fine. Over here, a little bit of blurring here on the snow. This white surface is made to look like snow. The background's all blurred out. A consistent light source, which is nice. So if there's a light source up here on the top left and it's radiating down to the right, that means the left side of all these trees will be lighter than the right side. That's important. So we need to make sure we have a consistency of light source. I've had a couple submissions where these three trees, these three trees, the light source is over here. And the middle three trees, light source for some reason seems to be up here. So we need to be aware of where our light source is, and that's going to help define where the light and dark areas are. And it'll visually make more sense to how the contrast is applied in our composition. And that in turn will help separate those compositional elements into their own little spaces. And our eyes will, and our mind will be able to make better sense of what we're looking at. So there's one solution there. Here's another one where very nice, clearly lighter grays in the background. The shop is the middle ground and these leaves are in the foreground. These bricks here, there's only two shades of gray, which is the tip of enough. Any more than that, you start to get into too much of a pattern and it becomes a lot of clutter and confusion potentially. But because the windows and the buildings in the back only have a couple of very light shades of gray, the middle ground shop doesn't get lost in with some of the elements in the background. So these bricks in the shop don't tie the shop into the background and sort of flatten the image out. So you have background, a nice clear for middle ground, and a very clear foreground where you have these nice dark leaves. Everything else is pretty much a straight line back here with the exception of a little curve on the top of the shop and a cloud. Everything in these leaves, by contrast, is pretty much a curved line. See over here to the right, not a lot of blurring going on, but not necessarily needed because of the high contrast used in the trees against the darker values in the very background. So the background, middle ground, foreground. Background's got darker elements. The middle ground has high contrast, dark and light. Foreground has a lot lighter elements in it. So it all works. And you can see same thing. I can cycle through all of these and say exactly the same thing. Nighttime scene, daytime scene. So if I jump over into Illustrator, so you have these images to work with, as you know. Here I have a couple of examples that I opened up here that look that are very nice. There were lots I could have chosen from. But uh, I just chose these. Yes, please resubmit because I would um, send you an email in regards to, well, these look very nice. However, I don't know if you've chosen three, five, or 10. If you guys send me something a second time, remember just to say it's version two. So I know the difference between the two and I can look for the differences, please. Okay, so I'll take here. So this looks very nice. Here's the owner. Here's shop. Wonderful dark tones 
and similarly shaded bricks for shop. So the shop really stands out against the much lighter background clouds and the buildings. The foreground is blurred out a lot more, but not a ton, but because of the contrast added by the dark values of these over top of these lighter grays and the fact it's blurred, and then the background is very, very light and it's slightly blurred, we focus directly on here, the shop. And because the shop has a whole ton of dark imagery in it, and with the high contrast of white windows, the shop stands out beautifully. It's easy to see all the back, middle ground and foreground elements, no problem. So what I do when this work is brought over, I select everything and I go and look down here to see if it, the fill chip has any um, question marks or color in it. Then I click the backslash and with the shop, I expect to see this outline around the shop disappear. I have no trouble with an outline around this shop because this is a clipping mask. So there's no deductions for having that. That doesn't matter. And that can just be taken away. And then that's what I do to confirm that that was the only reason why there was an outline there. So that looks fantastic. That's great. And then Scooching over here, yeah, see five values. Light sources consistently over here. More of a challenge working with five. You really have to think much harder about where you want to apply your shades of gray. You might want to amalgamate, amalgamate some other shades. Amalgamate, that's what I'm trying to say. A more a selective uh, use of the blurring the clouds in the foreground in front of the, not in the foreground, but in front of the mountains versus the clouds behind the mountains. Well, you can see the deliberation in the choosing which clouds and where the blur goes. And clouds in the back, far back are blurred. One's in the in front of the mountains, not. Everything else sharp focus, but there's good delineation between all the objects, good contrast, easy to see where everything is and it looks great. Here's another one. This is a nighttime scene. Here's the owner. Some of these I haven't gotten around to marking yet, I don't think. See, select everything here. No stroke at all. It's already been removed, so great. Sometimes I see a lot of stroke work in shop or and or in these windows. And in some cases, nice to keep things, just keep them simple. So simple means all the windows are same white or same gray. You don't have to have grays, different grays, different blacks, and all this other in there to create some sort of a pattern, unless you want through the pattern to have a lot of contrast, but we don't really need that, not for what we're doing here. It's not, uh, we want things to be less confusing. But you see the blur in the foreground, lighter images here in the foreground blurred, look fantastic. Clearly foreground elements stand out in contrast against the space in which the shop's standing. Looks like everything's being lit from the seated position I'm in. So you get the lighting on top of the leaves, the face of the buildings well lit, lots of contrast in the gray here against the grays in the background. Clearly, all the um, requirements for the project have been met very nicely here. It's nice to see no outlines. It's easy to discern where all the objects are. The background elements are more like supporting graphics to help make the middle ground and foreground pop a bit more. No rule says we have to see every single object as intensely as every other object. That's why with project one, when we had that bird flying in the sky in that box number four, we were exploring with those 10 shades, the sort of same treatment. We were forced to have to have grays that are similar close together. So then we build a visual appreciation. So here, five grays, same exact idea. Down below here, just two different shades of gray alternating, going around the perimeter of the soil. Darker grays here, lighter in the background, let the trees, this one looks a little blurred, which is very, it's a nice treatment. And the trees pop nicely. So background, middle ground, foreground, all clearly separated. Here's one. You see the owner, there we go. Same thing, no strokes, looks good. This time a nighttime scene but there's a little more emphasis on lighter content in the background. 
the foreground, the middle ground element of the shop pops very nicely. Go back here. Good image separation there. Different approach here, sort of alternated the, the tone of values from the background to the middle ground. Here we have bricks with a couple of different shades of gray, but that's the limit of, that's the limit I would suggest for um, tonal variety in the bricks. Otherwise you end up with a pattern that becomes a little confusing, but that works, that's good. So it looks very nice. No outlines is good. And then over here, it's a very light sort of hazy day, tons of separation between background and foreground because all these trees in the middle ground have high contrast. So this is where all the darkest material exists. Clearly a lot of the deliberation of thought went into the choices made here. Wonderful, looks good. Light sources consistently up here. That's good stuff. So I thought I'd show that. So from here, you guys can create something that looks maybe like this, something like that, or like this. And keep in mind, all these compositions have background, middle grounds, and foregrounds. So that's what I'm looking for first and foremost, as I mentioned before, is you know I want to be able to see these that sort of perceived depth. I need to see a back, middle, and foreground that are clearly obvious. And then based on how you treat the back, middle, and foreground, keeping in mind simplicity is good, just choose some middle range lighter values to isolate and keep in the background. Choose some other grays maybe that aren't being used in the background for the middle ground and use your darkest values. This is a simplistic way of thinking about it in the foreground. So what was once looking like a very complex shape or collection of shapes is now a well-organized composition with easily discernible content areas. So does that make reasonable sense, gang? Yeah. That's Great. Really good. Thank you. So I'm gonna jump back here. Now, before I consider moving ahead, does anybody have any questions or anything like to screen share in regards to project two or three? Okay, good. Now the reason we're working at with contrast is because we're gonna start getting into color and illustrator some more later on in Photoshop starting now, but we're gonna start migrating and looking at cool versus warm colors. And that'll be our sort of gateway into working with some Photoshop and there'll be good contrast in this Photoshop document when we go from warm to cool. Okay, so let's jump into Photoshop then. Okay, so here, I'll go back here. Weekly course modules. So this is released down here now. This is in weekly course modules section, or again, you can go into the assignments labs menu area. Same thing, you have access in here. You can see when this next project that we're going to start on is due today. And because people typically have in the classes different experience levels with Photoshop, some people get this wrapped up in a day. Others need a little more time to work on the project. We'll be able to work on this project next week for sure. So what we'll do today is work on some, a couple of practice files I've supplied so we can have the experience of seeing how the tools work, experience how the tools work and apply these in a way, to, in a meaningful way to some content so we can see the results of how the tools work, what we can accomplish and extrapolate what we've done into other images, not just the ones I've supplied. So here at the table of contents for our uh, week three, four, because we're overlapping projects now, here's your typical color wheel. It looks like our uh, project three, all the primary hues, but not st stacked up into a tower wrapped around in a circle. The division between cool colors and warm colors, sometimes people separate here versus here. It's not that critical, but all the warm colors are on this side of the color wheel. All the cool colors are on the other side. 
I've supplied an image that has a lot of this in it. We're going to convert those to in this area. And just having contrast, say yellow versus purple alone, those colors will accent each other and make each other stand out a lot more than just as they as they would if they just stood apart from each other and we didn't see purple we had lots of orange and yellow for example but if we're looking to really emphasize something and generate color contrast we would start with the complementary color which would be you know the other side of the, the color wheel so here we go with a reminder about what's doing when so we know all about this that's for last week We have in here a bunch of stuff to download. There's some PDF files. There's a little a bit of information about uh, accessibility. There's a color, there's a contrast color checker that we can download later on. And has anybody worked with a, a contrast checker, a color checker? Just to make sure that there's enough contrast, for example, between some text in the text and then the background that the text is applied on. Okay, that's what this addresses. There's lots of different ways to check for contrast. Some, are, some of those methods are built directly into browsers. And, but we'll talk about that later. We have the color has meaning again. I keep bringing that forward because that's important. We have the Photoshop conversion. A lot of there's 134 megs worth of content here. Lots of bitmap material, pixels per inch versus dots per inch. So we look at digital versus uh, print. So, and then bitmap versus vector file formats. So what we have there, just very small PDF files that we'll reference occasionally moving forward. I'll just open them up and make us aware of them. That's uh, moving down. Project four due at the latest week five, but if there's some people who can really move quickly, week four. But we don't want, for people that have more experience with software than other people, just keep in mind that we, we're gonna go at, a, at an intro pace. So some people, my point being, may be finishing projects sooner than other people, that's all. But we're not gonna be releasing new content based on whoever moves quickest through the semester. We have a structure, just in case anybody's thinking that. So here's a couple of little links to some tutorials if, in case anybody wants additional information regarding Photoshop. That'll take you into working with some of the basics in Photoshop. Again, the menu bar, some basic uh, workspace layouts. And then this link, if you're interested, will take you to a better and greater selection of some Photoshop files to work with. If anybody felt like taking that path, that's all. These videos here that I've supplied will take us through a lot of the tools we need in order to work with, uh, work on this new project. They're not stacked up in any particular order. Just making sure that all the links still work because you never know from moment to moment. So I'm doing a little bit of adding new layers, duplicating existing layers. So there's a copy to work with just in case something mucks up. Then working with some masks. And if we have a layer mask over here, working with a layer mask that's attached to this object lets us work with black and white or tones in between to create different levels of transparency. And the reason I have a green background underneath here is when I brush on top of this white thumbnail, get out of here, I'm brushing with black. Black is removing the mask. So I can see now through what looks like a hole in this image and reveal what's underneath in this other layer. But because I'm working with the layer mask, I'm non-destructively editing because I'm not physically knocking a hole in the actual image. And I can reverse that process by getting white and then I can paint white in here and bring this all back. 
So this is just a super simple there. See, and then it comes back again, non-destructive editing, real simple look at working with layer mask as a gateway into working in and dealing with non-destructive editing. If you work with a gradient instead of a hard, just black to white, well, the values of white to black with the tonal values in between create that fade into invisible. So if think of an old, I don't know, Star Trek Next Generation poster. It's a giant face shot of Jean-Luc Picard. Half his face is Jean-Luc, the other half is the Borg. Those two images blend together. Layer masking would accomplish that, no problem. Layer masking, non-destructive editing are very much introductory concepts in Photoshop. And I keep sort of demoing more of the same thing on this little three minute video. If I have that thumbnail selected and I'm working with white, I'm physically painting on that object and that's destructive. As long as you're not physically altering the original image, you're doing things non-destructively. If you're physically altering the actual original image, you're being very destructive. This video here runs us through, <coughs> excuse me, some of the basic selection tools. And we'll start by doing a little of this to begin with. And I've supplied these um, photographs to work with in these simple images. There's lots of different ways to select content. And for those of you that have worked with Photoshop and you've worked with the magic wand tool and clicked on a big white area, you know what I'm talking about. But now the thing is in here, there's all these other little white pockets that are within the confines of these sort of green frames. So instead of using the magic wand tool to select each one of these areas individually, well, what we do is just select one of the areas and then choose select and similar fill. And then everything of that particular selection value can be highlighted and then go press delete and they're all gone. So a lot of little things like this. So some of you, I'm sure, know what I'm talking about. So we look at some of that. See, and suddenly that's all cleared out. And you get jagged edges, and there's ways to clean these jagged edges a little bit too. There's a history panel in Photoshop. So unlike Control Z, history panel is a little more precise. You can see exactly which command you've applied. I think the default setting for the history panel undoes is 20 or 40, I forget but you can clearly see a list. You can click on each layer and go backwards in time if you need to at any time. I'll look at the fringing later. And then just working with some of the other tools is the quick selection tool. And we can adjust the brush size to add or subtract from our selections. And the brush size, think of that as altering the tolerance setting. And that only means something to people who have worked with tolerance settings with the magic wand tool. The polygon tool, we're just dealing with straight lines. You can click, 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 and go all around your selection. And now you're working with straight lines as opposed to trying to work with just the basic lasso tool and make straight lines, which is impossible. And again, this little video is just meant to give us a quick introductory look at some selection tools, how they can be used very simply. Then once you've made a selection, if it's taking you a little while to make a selection, whatever it is, I'm gonna go back here a bit. I'll pretend it took me a long time to make that selection. You can save your selections and come back to them at a later date at any time. And the reason you would do that is based on the complexity and the trouble involved in making a selection, you don't wanna go back and make that same selection and go down that road every single time. So once you have a selection, you can just go up into the menu bar and just select save. And then you can give your selections any old name you want. The selection will always be associated with this file. So call it whatever you want. The default setting looks just like this. It's a new channel. Call it anything. Right. And then if I choose to deselect this, there. Instead of reselecting all of this again, doing the same thing again, just selecting another, I'm saving two selections just for demo purposes to show saving multiple selections in a single file. Skip ahead. There. Now, 
Did I go too far ahead? Now we'll do it in a little bit. Yeah, back, okay, so. Yeah, just leave it at that then. Cause you just go back up and you find your selection, click load and that selection you have before it's, it's now available. This video is still working, great. Other selections, uh, ways of selecting, just showing here that whatever you have selected, and I've supplied all the images that you see in these particular files, guys. So if there's a tennis ball here. I'm unlocking the layer that it's a part of. And again, I like to drag and drop here to make a duplicate layer, just because I'm retentive about that. In case I destroy this, I always have an original. That's just me. If I get the brush tool, I can start brushing all over here and make a big mess. If I make a selection around the tennis ball, I can only brush within a selection is all I'm getting at. So we have to be aware of whether we want a selection needed or not based on whatever our objective is. And then what layer have we selected is important. So we have to make sure that we're going to a layer that uh, contains the information we want to manipulate. And we'll get a, and we'll take a little look at some of this where we end up working with adjustment layers to alter what looks like the color of very in a very rudimentary rudimentary way the color of the tennis ball. And then we can go into our selections and we can erase again just like a layer mask up here and see our original image. Photoshop is a, a lot about making selections and then being able to do something with those selections. There, and then this eight minute and 21 second long video takes us through what's required. And this is our practice image going from a warm to cool look. This is what we'll do as a group. So this video walks us through all the tools needed and their introductory uh, level Photoshop tools. All the tools needed to take an image like this, adjust the size of it, the physical dimensions, make some selections, change some colors, do some non-destructive editing, add some new layers, throw a, a simple little filter on it, blur and noise, take us through some basic stuff. We'll have proper layer and layer management involved in what we're doing here as well. And uh, that's all that'll happen, really. So it's just, it'll look fancier than it is, but we'll end up working with essential tools. So if I go back here, so that's what these files will do. We'll start with a little bit of what's in here, and then we'll jump right down to this. And this is just back to Color and Design, Tense Illustrator, InDesign again. Just a little refresher because it was needed for something we did in a previous semester and I just chose to keep it here. Now back up into the table of contents, there are reference examples available to give you a sense of visually what it is the layer structure will look like. So here's the before of this image, here's the after. These are all the layers we need, that's it, for successful completion of this kind of a project. Keep in mind what we're doing is just practice, we're using these images I've supplied as practice images, gang. You guys can go out between now and next week, find your own image, and we'll discuss what um, qualifies as uh, acceptable material for this project, acceptable, acceptable imagery soon enough. So warm to cool, totally different vibe between the two. Here are all the layers involved in this. Here's what this file starts out as. Another one, warm to cool, same basic layer structure. Warm to cool again, there's the layer structure. And down here, some other images that I've supplied. That's it. So you get a sense of what your layers panel will look like by the time we go from here over to here. So if you good people, 
could kindly download all of this stuff. I didn't want to put all the PDF files into a single folder because sometimes it's just nice to look at them here and then just move on. So if you can download all of that, that would be terrific. There we go, that's, uh, it's gonna be a little easier. just have to organize some of these panels. That out of the way, that out of the way. Because then what you will have will be all this stuff. By the time you take the contents out of the zip folder and have downloaded these PDF files. So if you can let me know when you have all those, please, that would be terrific because we can go in here with some of the available content and start, and we can start working on exploring some of the tools. Wow, you're fast. <laughs> I'll wait for a couple other people to get ready. And again, I say this every class, I can appreciate some people might like to just sit back and watch what we're doing and then digest the information and come back and work on this at a later date. But remember, we have time to work on our projects uh, in class, as well as out of class, and our due dates are all clearly listed. So don't be in a big hurry to finish anything. Uh, I would be in I'd be more concerned about just remembering how you've accomplished tasks X, Y, and Z, because we use all this stuff and we build upon this knowledge so we can move forward and work with other tools and build other things. And, okay, gang, so what I'm going to do is just walk you through some of the what's inside here. So this folder up here called Gorge stuff, you don't have that, that's just my stuff. We have all these PDFs, we'll look at those later. Oh, we'll look at the assignment sheet first, that would be better. So you're gonna take one of the files I've got for practice and that's all it's gonna be for is practice. Then you guys can find your own photo and you can vet it through me to make sure that it works as the proper kind of photograph to work with. So our image is gonna be anywhere from 500 by 500 up to 2000 by 2000 pixels. Anything in between is good. It has to be an outdoor picture. We have to work with proper blending modes, which we'll need in order to simulate some of the color treatments and the snowy look. We'll need correct adjustment layers. There'll be hue and saturation and color. The adjustment layers are non-destructive editing and then proper use of selections. So that's a layer mask and I walk us through that. And whatever image we work with, we haven't touched it physically at all. So non-destructive editing, the Photoshop file will have all the visible um, layers still available, they're editable, nothing's flattened. And through whatever I see in here, that'll convince me that you, you know how to work with this project, uh, work through this project. I know this due date says one week from handout date, we've got one to two. There, so project four, do class week five. It can be handed in next week if you'd like. Yeah, so we've got lots of time to work on these. I know that project two, that grayscale and contrast interactions will take time. It's time consuming, but it's designed to be that way to a point. And the reason again is because it makes us spend enough time thinking about what we're doing that we stand a much greater chance of retaining the information and we'll be able to recall our choices and reasons for those choices with other projects. So this is only week three right now, this project four. 
is due a long way down the road. Our projects become a little more intensive as we move along. Some we interject in, along the way something that's a little simpler. This one here is a little simpler. And by that, I just mean the duration involved, time involved in finishing the, creating the finished product. But we will have overlapping projects as we move through the semester. Okay, so in what you've downloaded, we have week three material inside that folder. That's the name of the folder. We have this accessibility document again, and we have the color has meaning document. Here are all the videos that we need to work with. These are the ones that uh, I posted in Blackboard, but now you can watch them offline if you need to. And some sample lab files inside there. Let's get the bamboo JPEG file. So in Photoshop, if I choose file, open, I'm going to go into Where is that file? Did I copy it over here? I thought I did. Did I accidentally move it? Ah, I'll go just grab it again. Do it this way. File. Open. Go down to D drive. There. So just looking for bamboo. Open. And that'll be fine. So for some of you, this will be very straightforward. For others, this will just be all new stuff. All we're going to do here is go and select the white and get it out of the background. Just the way I demoed it here. Okay, and back to Photoshop, there we are. So let me know, for those of you that want to work along here, let me know when we're here. And then it can move forward. Again, I can appreciate some people will just want to sit back and watch this, or they've done this before and can do it upside down in their sleep. We're looking for the file called bamboo JPEG. And that will be located in the folder called GRA 160 week three material. In there is the 160 week three sample lab files. Bamboo is the first one. And that's where fall, winter, forest, fox, all these other files exist. And somebody let me know when we're ready to move ahead here. Okay. I'm going to duplicate this layer. So I'm just going to select in the layers panel and your panels might look different than mine and that's fine. If you have the toolbar out here, that's great. Layers panel, that's good. Let's go and get the history panel out. So if you choose, go to the menu bar and go to window, choose history. Just want us to be aware of the existence of it. Over here in the toolbar, there's a magic wand tool. But you might see one of these tools. If you see one of these other tools, hold your left mouse button down on that expanding arrow. Enjoy the little video tool tip, but hold the left mouse button down and get the magic wand tool, please. The magic wand tool lets us click on a pixel or a neighboring group of pixels have their color range, white, black, white's technically a tint, black's a shade, and everything else is some of their color or values in between there, we can adjust the tolerance setting. Just means how forgiving or not when we click, 
our selection will be. So with that magic wand tool selected, which is your standard issue, it's, it's like a pair of pliers to a carpenter. And you can see in this little visual, that solid color orange is being selected. There's nothing else like the orange. As soon as you click and release, Photoshop looks for all that kind of orange and it's done. It's not going to find orange inside of the lizard because the orange inside of the little lizard is surrounded and protected by the other colors outside of it. So the pixels have to be shaking hands in order to be selected. Okay, so if I go up here now with my magic wand tool selected, change the tolerance setting to one, and that's as intolerant as it can get. And then I click somewhere, I'll just zoom in here, on the white in that area. That one is very, very particular. So based on exactly, I'm zoom way in, exactly the color or tone of that single pixel that's right there or whatever that value is, as long as that value pixel is next to other pixels of the exact same value, selections will keep growing outwards. And as soon as there's any deviation from that super intolerant, that's as low as it gets, one, that's when the selection stops. So you can see not a great selection. So I'd like to deselect that now. So you Photoshop people, anybody know the hotkeys to deselect what I have? Uh, the shortcut is Control plus D. Exactly. So Control D, if you go up here as well, gang, into the menu bar and choose Select, there's Deselect, Command D on the Mac. All right, so Control D. And then you can see what I'm doing over here in the history panel as well. So here, I'm going to make a copy of this layer. And then I'm going to make a brand new blank layer by clicking here. And I'm going to take that new layer and drag it here. I want it sandwiched between these two layers. And the reason is we're going to put a, a new color in here. And that way, when we start making deletions on this top layer, we'll visually verify, hey, they're real deletions because we'll see the color we have down here. And this is the only little tool button we used was the create new layer button. You can drag, and drag an existing layer onto it to make a duplicate or just click on it and don't drag anything and you've got yourself a new layer. If you have too many layers, select the layer and drag it to the trash bin. and let me know when we're ready, gang. And like anything else, Photoshop program, just have to practice a bit. Being able to select objects is critical. There's so many different ways to do it that uh, you'll know which method you want to work with when you come across a, an image that requires something a little more complex than just clicking on white. Okay, so are we ready to fill this blank layer with a color? If we are, we want to go to the paint bucket tool. If you do not see some of the tools that I have in your toolbar here, down here where these three little dots are, click edit toolbar or hold the mouse button, come here. You'll see some other tools pop up here. You can select them and then bring them over. But what we're going to do is just give that a quick fill. So if we get the paint bucket tool, you might see the 3D bucket. You might see the gradient. Choose the paint bucket tool, please. Press G. That's the hot key just to get paint bucket. Or in, at least into this area. And let me know, please, when we have the paint bucket tool. Again, for those of us who are going to do this. Does anybody need me to revisit anything quickly? Okay. Now we're going to fill this 
layer, be aware of which layer you have selected. I've got my blank layer selected here. A couple of ways we can select and fill content, but we're just going to use the paint bucket tool. We can always go up into the menu bar and choose edit and fill and fill something. And so we're not going to do that. We're just going to get the paint bucket tool. Here's our fill chip, the foreground color. If I double click on that foreground color, color picker pops up again. I'm going to choose anything other than green. The red works for me, so good. Now, if I click, it looks like I'm clicking right here on my artboard. My artboard's a tip of technically what you call the spaces in um, the boards in Illustrator. People call these artboards, they're technically called canvases. Now, if I click here, you'll see my thumbnail over here where I have things selected, fill with red. I can't see the red because I have a layer on top of it where the visibility is still invisible. So for people brand new, fresh to Photoshop, don't be confused and think you didn't do anything correctly. Just being aware of the stacking order of our layers, the top layer is what's on the top. That's what we would see first. And we can turn the visibility of any of our layers off or on any time we want. So we need to be aware of layers. Because when we start making selections or filling content, as we click around, we might be in layer we don't want to be in, that's all. Okay, so now let's delete some of the white. And all I'm doing to zoom in or out is the same thing I've done in the other programs, guys, is just press control minus or plus. And so if I get the magic wand tool again now, click on the top layer. You double click on the layer name, you can edit the name. So I can call it top layer if I'd like. Just double click on the name, give them any name you want. Top layer, magic wand tool, or just press W. Adjust the tolerance setting up to something else. Maybe 44 is good. If I click, if I change my tolerance setting to something a little more tolerant, 44, click on white. Well, that looks to be a little bit better. And if you went with like 88, the higher the number, the less tolerant, get up to 255. That means everything gets selected. There's no tolerance whatsoever. Everything's included in. You try to type anything beyond 255 levels, you can't get past that. Just like you, same thing for RGB, same thing for levels of gray you'll be told, no, integer between 0 to 255. So you're only going up to 255. So one is super, super intolerant, very picky, very precise. 255 means everything is being selected. So some combination inside there, I'll say 55. When I click on white here with 55, that looks OK. I'll press the Delete key now. And I can see my red content underneath there. And for those of you that are familiar with Photoshop, to get rid of that marquee, it looks like marching ants. People call them marching ants. If you want to still have your selection active, but you don't want to see the marching ants, you can press Command or Control H. It just hides the marching ants. For those of you doing that, how'd that work out? Not bad. Now we'll be using selections and we'll have mar mar marching ants here when we, in a probably 15 minutes, move on to working with that fall winter scene. Now, do you guys want me to speed up or slow down? 
you guys help guide me through the pace that works best for you. Okay, here, let's save this selection then. We'll pretend we took a lot of time to get here. It was very complex. In reality, it was really simple. So with our selection already active here, if we go up into the menu bar and choose select, save selection, all we're doing is saving the selection. The save selection dialog box pops up and I'll just call it, uh, that's it. Click OK. Now, if you deselect, press Control D and deselect, and say this is a different type of area, and you, it was very difficult to select that again, you can just go back up into the menu bar, choose Select. Now, Load Selection is an option. And when you have Channel, choose from the list that could appear here, because you might have a pile of different selections, choose the channel that you want to select again, click OK, and there it is. That's as simple as it is for saving and loading selections. This selection is an easy one to make because it's just all one solid white color, but if there was a gradient fill in there, we'd have to select in different ways. So it's nice to have the selection, uh, something we can access potentially later on by just loading it after it's saved. And keep in mind, everything I'm doing here, gang, it's also in the little video. Now, if I want to now do the same thing with all these other white areas, here's a magic wand tool. Look at all those little white spaces. If I click up here, all I can do is select what's in this white area. There's no more white outside these green jail bars. We'll go. <laughs> There's no way for this white pixel to find other white pixels, which would mean I'd have to go around and hold the shift key down and just start clicking on everything. It's crazy to do that. So instead of doing that, I'll deselect everything. Um, who could tell me what I could do now in regards to doing the similar selection thing. Those of you that's with some Photoshop experience, if you wanted to, like, how can I quickly select all of these based on uh, defining one area first? And I'm assuming somebody might know how to do that. If not, fine. It's all crickets. I thought somebody might have known. I'll click this white area. It's all similar here. So take that. Up into the menu bar, choose select, similar, anything similar to what I selected, it's automatically selected. I'll press delete. I'll hide my selection first, just make it visible and visible. Press delete. There you go. And for fun, I'll save that selection as well. Back into the menu bar, select, select, save selection. Give it any old name, tons of selections works for me. Click OK. And for all intents and purposes, that's, <coughs> excuse me, how we could use the magic wand tool. For quick, down and dirty, just selections of something. The concept behind working with select and similar, that's all there is to that. And then saving and then loading selections. There are the loaded uh, selections I can, or save selections, I can load them anytime I want. I can appreciate it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's necessary for sure. I probably bored 99% of you here. Okay, so 
Anybody need a recap of that or should we move on? Good. Okay, open. I'm going to bring in another file. Now I'll bring in Sunset and Empire State. Click open. So here, just like the video, and again, you guys feel free, tell me to slow down or speed up anytime. I'll get this quick selection tool. And now I can adjust the brush size. Now, in order, you can go up here to adjust the brush size. I'll wait till you guys have the, this image open a little bit. But when we work with, think of, when we work with the magic wand tool, the numerical value for tolerance, defines sort of the, the sensitivity of that selection. With the quick selection tool, the size of the brush, this is actually a brush, will help define the sensitivity of our selection. And this is a nice high contrast area that photo to work with. So what we'll do is work with this brush, the quick selection tool, and just mask out or select this entire backdrop area here. I'll create a new layer just for fun, plunk it underneath. Now, up here, and whenever you're working with anything to do with brushes, you can always just go up to the top left, see something that looks like a little area where you can add, uh, alter your brush size at it. Just the brush size like this, and then hardness or feathered edge. So I'll just stick with, uh, I don't know, that's good enough. And if you have a tablet with a stylus, you can also work with that. So you can see how my quick selection tool has changed in size. Now, if you want to quickly adjust the size, next to where you see in your keyboard, you know, IOP, you have those two brackets. The left bracket makes that brush smaller, the right bracket makes that brush larger. And that's how brush sizes can very quickly be edited size-wise. So if I now click and paint, there. Now, why did all of that get selected? I know I did this on purpose because I know it's going to happen to people. What layer did I have selected? Exactly. So go back here. Now, oops, deselect. And you can see based on the size of the brush, I started to fill in in this area here. Photoshop started to figure out what I was trying to get at and then just jumped in and filled all this area in for me. Press delete. Ta-da. It kind of looks like a, one of the backdrops in the movie Dune. If you go with a smaller brush, the left bracket, It'll take a little longer there. So the quick selection tool is based on the tolerance setting, it's looking for a little bit of contrast between what you're trying to select versus what you're not. And this is just a really simple example of how that process works. The silhouetted mountain is really, really dark compared to all of this. Now, I don't know if you can see, my cursor is by default the addition. I'm adding to my selection. And as you can always subtract from your selections. You can do the same thing with the magic wand tool because sometimes you, add, you select more than you might want to. If you wanted to go toggle between the two of these, you can see on my brush here, has that plus sign in it. On all software packs, all the computers, if you hold the Alt key down, that's how you can quickly alternate between adding and subtracting from selections. There, I'm subtracting. So there's a hole in there now, or solids. So if I go down here, yeah, I'll do this all over again after I fill this in. 
there. Quick selection tool, add to my selection, and then I'll subtract from my selection. Whoops. So you can see what's happening there. So you add or subtract from your selection. If I want to add to this selection, I can add to my existing selection. Depends what I'm trying to do. Just an option, that's all. Okay, that's quick selection tool that works. That's all we need to know about that right now. So we work magic wand, quick selection tool. And you can save any selection anytime. It's the same process. If I save this selection here, that selection, in case anybody's wondered, will not be available over here in Bamboo. The selections are specific to the file you worked on. Okay. Now I'm going to jump over into Empire State Building. And in the lasso tool up here, there's a polygon tool and there's a magnetic. The lasso tool. You just click and hold and you're just freeform drawing a selection. If you release before you get to the end of your selection, Photoshop will draw a straight line between those two endpoints and make the selection for you. So this is just for quick selecting of whatever. The polygon tool is just for making straight lines. So click and release. Like you pretend you're making straight lines with the pen tool in Illustrator. Click, release, click, release. That's it. Click, release. And for selecting an object like this, maybe the polygon tool is the way to go. But you can see nice contrast in the background with the sky. So maybe the quick selection tool is the way to go. And you can see up here, there's too much selection going on. So that's where you would subtract from your selection, make the brush a lot smaller. Hold the Alt key down, not just combinations of coming in and working on that. So very roughly, you can kind of see what I'm getting at there. Now I can appreciate for people that have never touched Photoshop at all, what we're doing is probably seeming like we're going at warp speed through these tools and there's no way, you might be thinking, there's no way I'm gonna remember this. This is crazy to be showing this stuff at this pace right now with this kind of volume. The comfort level will come soon enough for sure. I, it's always worked out for everybody. There's really, unfortunately, isn't any other way to navigate through some of the basic selection tools without doing this. And because they bundle together nicely, it makes sense to do them all at once. And rather than rely on memory, that's why I made a little video so you could just get a visual refresher with call out. So, oh yeah, that's what that does. That's how that works. After that, it's just a matter of having the experience of working with the tool on different kinds of images. And then it suddenly clicks, oh, okay, that makes sense now. And so those selection tools, uh, get the magnetic control D. So look at, all we did was look at magic wand, not object, magic wand, quick selection, last tool, polygon is for straight lines and the magnetic tool, it looks for contrasting pixels. And as I draw up here, it tries to make a path around and on the edge of where the contrast in the pixels occurs. I just keep holding my left mouse button down. That's how it works. So Photoshop has made available all these selection tools and based on the kind of imagery you're trying to select from, some of those tools are combination and there's different ways that you approach selecting content. Okay, gang, I'll just, we'll take a break in maybe three minutes, if that's okay. Does that sound good to you guys?
quiet out there. Now, before I show us this, we get into uh, something else. By all means, feel free to turn on your mic and tell me to slow down, back up, show some of this again at any time. Okay, so we'll do that. It's quite, you guys are quiet this aft. So remember here, this top video right here shows us how to work with those selection tools. I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's necessary. <laughs> okay, jump back in here to Photoshop. So here's, let's see. If I turn all, if I turn all of this off, that's the original image. When we start working with some selections and fill in those selections, these are layer masks, that's non-destructive editing. We can start creating the illusion of some snow on here. We're gonna start changing some of the color. Then we work with hue and saturation. We desaturate. We've already seen visually what happens when we sat desaturate something, we're lightening something up. So we're lightening the entire document here. This is non-destructive editing. We can go into specific channels for that or just overall desaturate. That looks much, much, much cooler already than that. Then to put a blue cast on everything, an adjustment layer of blue. Not a bright blue, but something that's cooler. Then these layers that have noise with some wind attached to them, so they're blowing, and that looks like a real snowy day. So from that to this, there's a significant difference in the visual outcome there. And introducing ourselves to layer masks, Adjustment layers, those are all non-destruct, those are all non-destructive elements. And some new layer creation by just creating some noise and then blurring them and adding a blending mode on them, introducing us to some more blending modes, creates all of this. Which I think is pretty neat. So this is the direction we're going to go with this project as our this file as our sample file. And along that journey to go from that to this, we'll be looking at some of the selection tools we just had a quick little tour of. And they're essential need to know tools, so layer management, uh, non-destructive editing, layers, different types of selections, uh, some blending modes. That's all good stuff that we need to be aware of. So instead of having really, really simple projects, I thought we'd practice with something like this because it's visually more interesting. So you can see nice warm colors down here. That's what we're going to go and change. And then between now and next week, you guys are going to need to come up with your own picture that has a lot of land that has cool color on it. A, a good amount of cool, a warm surface area, I should say, that will convert into something cool. So there might be a holiday photo somewhere. The sky doesn't count. It has to be physical surface area that has all the warmth in it. Hay fields, something else, cliffs somewhere. And we're going to go from befores to the afters. What we're doing today is just practicing that. Whoops. And again, so you don't have to commit your, all this to memory. This video down here walks us through. It's a project walkthrough. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pause the recording and I'll mute myself. And if we come back, it's two o'clock. If we come back at 2.15, 
I think that gives us enough time to stretch our legs and go throw a snowball at something. So here we are back in Photoshop. And then over here, I'll just jump us into YouTube just so we can sort of compare apples to apples here with this video. Are you still just have to put up with some ads at first here. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We're going to go with this exact same image. Then we're going to go and check out the actual dimensions of it to make sure we're working within specs. The assignment sheet and the rubric say 500 by 500 or 2000 by 2000. So as long as we're not exceeding 2000 or below 500 somewhere, we're all good. And then making a duplicate of that layer because we will need that. And then we're going to create a hue and saturation layer and start getting into some adjustment layers. Very simple stuff, but it's all, it's not going to feel like that at all if this is the first time you've, you have used Photoshop. Now we can apply a lot of the settings we're working with uh, in different sequences. So, but what we'll do is what we see here right now. So we'll do a hue and saturation adjustment layer and desaturate our content. And then we'll jump into another adjustment layer where we can work with a solid color. And then we'll apply a dark blue because we're going from warm to cool. We have the ability to adjust the opacity, which dulls everything, but the opacity in conjunction with a different blending mode. Soft light, soft light works really well. So here we go, and that's the direction we're going to go. Based on the color blue and soft light, the underlying colors will tend to look a little more like this. Now over here in the folder that has these files we just drew upon, if you open up this Photoshop, this Photoshop blending modes file, I put together a little Word document that gives you a technical definition of what all these blending modes are. And that's there just in case somebody wanted to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, read up on what these mean. I don't necessarily think that this uh, clears things up particularly, but you get a sense of what the intended uh, usage is of these blending modes. And blending modes are all about how one color overlaps with another what that interaction is like. So these are the technical definitions of that. Effect screen, dodge, um, darken, color burn, linear, all of these. And they're very useful. It's not like you will never consider working with these again. That's for sure. So we'll work with Q and saturation, solid fill layer. We'll have duplicates of this. So. We'll have duplicates of this background layer. So I'm just turning off, I'm clicking on this lock to unlock this layer. And then I'm dragging the layer down here. So I have a duplicate. Once we're familiar with these tools, this project would actually, this exercise here, which will then migrate into a project, will only take five minutes. Yeah, and for those of you that are working along, let me know when we're ready to move on to the next step. Okay. And the next step is going to be just going up into the menu bar and choosing image, can, invis, <laughs> image size. You can see how large this is. This sucker's huge. It's thick 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. You can see down below here, well, you can see how large this is here, 680, 668.7 megs. With duplicate layers, it starts to increase substantially in size. 
layers will add to file size. Resolution will impact as well. So if I go from 72 to 300, we're at one gig. But look at the size of the pixels. We can also go back in and change the dimensions of the pixels here, but we're not going to do that. So there's a relationship between resolution and the dimensions. So instead of six, of, instead of 6,000 by 4,000, we know that 2,000 is max. So if we just type in 2,000 at the largest number, whatever we're left with for the other numbers, oh, link those together there. I thought that was linked. So I change one of these numbers, the other value will correspondingly make some changes. So draw that to two there, whatever this number is, that's good. So we know that they're scaling down proportionally. Then click OK. We're now from 68 megs to seven and a half. There. This will look smaller, doesn't matter. We just control plus to get back in or get the magnification tool. Just zoom in again. Looks nice and crisp and clean. It still works great. But we need to be aware of the image size. We're just cleaning up the image size now, making it the proper size, not something gigantic. Because you can always change the canvas, <coughs> sorry, the image size after you do all the work. But why not work with something smaller? It's less work for your computer, for starters. <coughs> and so all we've done is duplicate this layer and adjust the image size to 2000 by the, we're good to 1,333. <coughs> okay. Now over here, these are where adjustment layers are found. Click on this button here. And over here, I mean where this little white black Oreo cookie is. Select from the pop-up menu, hue and saturation. Photoshop people use adjustment layers all the time. There. This adjustment layer is automatically assigned above the layer that is at the top or the layer we would have had selected. Now, had we just had this object, this layer selected and gone over here into the menu bar and chose image adjustments, we have these same options, but they're going to be destructively edited because they're going to be physically applied to that object. We don't want that. That's why we're going with the adjustment layer so we can have the same effect, but it's only mathematically making a change on here. It's not physically making a change. So here's hue and saturation. All we're doing is just moving the saturation slider to the left. We want this to be cooler. So if we desaturate versus saturate, desaturate, we take all that warmth out. And that's primarily because we have a lot of warmth in the actual colors that make up this image. So slide the saturation slider to the left a little bit. Great, we don't have to touch lightness. Just leave it where it is. Yeah, zero, there, that's better. And let me know when we're there again. And remember, this is just like a practice, a dry run of the features and the tools we'll work with but on your own image next class. Yeah, so for those of you doing this, let me know if you need me to go back and uh, recap this a little bit, slow down, or if we're ready to move forward. But I'm gonna wait from you guys before I start doing something else. I'm just concerned I'm moving too slowly or too quickly, and that won't help you guys in the least. And everything I'm doing here as well, gang, is in the, that video I showed us that's since available in Blackboard. Are we getting close to being able to move forward here, gang? Okay, good. And now you can see here in the properties panel for this hue and saturation, 
this little button here. Now this means I can assign whatever this hue and saturation adjustment layer is doing directly to the layer underneath. Without that selected, I'm going to turn this layer off here, which means I can only see the layer at the bottom. You can see that I still have this, this adjustment layer working on all the layers directly below it. We want to be a little fussier, so it's good to be aware of the fact that this, when we click it, that means we are now only applying hue and saturation to the layer directly underneath. Turned off, everything comes along for the ride. And the bottom layer is visible, so that's why when uh, every, this is clipped to this layer, that's why this isn't changed, because that layer is below everything else. The layer that this is clipped to, you'll see that layer directly below it gets a little underline on it. There, that layer now has been cherry picked from amongst all the other layers because this adjustment layer is directly on top of this, this uh, layer to receive that hue and saturation. It's good to be aware of this. So we're just clipping to the selection below. Now let's do the same thing, but let's add some blue to this. So deselect, click on nothing, go back to hue and saturation. And this time we're going to get a solid color. And this go in and get a nice blue of some sort, something that looks like a wintry kind of dark blue. That'll work for me. And then just click OK. That's it. There's no one right value. Just pick something that's cool. Not in this bright area, that's too bright, something darker, like that. And then click OK. And then I'll just tie us into what we're doing in the actual video. So this is all we're doing. It's comparing apples to apples here. So I'll take this layer and I'll make sure that the blending mode, where is soft light? There it is. That's not bad, but I can also tweak that a bit. That looks okay. So it's a subjective thing. Before, after. So it makes it even cooler. So the combination of human saturation and the color fill takes this and makes that so much cooler. So we took this, desaturated it a bit. So that takes some of the warmth out because we're desaturating what is primarily a warm tone image. And then we're adding some blue to cool it off even more. So it already looks pretty frosty. All that's missing is the snow. And let me know when we're ready to move forward with that, gang. Because now we'll add the snow. But we'll use the eyedropper tool in a special way by using the color range feature from the select menu. And the color range selector, we'll be using that all the time. It's a good way to select another selection tool to select content from within another object. But it gives us a little more flexibility. There's a few more options. And again, jump in and just say, hey, can you repeat that? Can you move faster? Whatever it is you need to do in order to um, follow along or understand what it is that I'm saying and demoing. But definitely give, let me know when we're ready to move ahead, though, for sure. And you'll become comfortable for sure with where these tools are located and what they do just through the sheer repetition of working with them. 
and they are they're essential we need to know about the existence of these tools um, type of tools and features so we will be using them throughout the semester for sure and in other semesters you guys will be reflecting back on all these photoshop tools and building more photoshop knowledge and InDesign and Illustrator. And after we do some color range work to select areas on the image ground that we're uh, used to apply snow to, after that is done, then we'll create a blank layer with some noise. We'll apply a different effect to that. So the noise will look like static noise. We'll put a blending mode on it to get rid of the blacks while we're left with is the white. It's a quick way to create the illusion of snow. And then we'll put a Gaussian blur on it so the snow has soft edges. We'll motion blur it so it looks like there's some velocity to the snow. And that for all intents and purposes will walk us through a lot of the uh, essential little tools that we need to be familiar with in order to work on, in simple ways, work on some Photoshop uh, related type projects and some images. So shall we proceed with the next phase of development? Okay. Now, so here in the video, color range. What we're doing is we're going to get the color range selection tool. We're going to grab this eyedropper tool. And within the preview panel we see here, we're going to make a selection on the ground area. We don't want snow clinging to space. We want snow clinging to the ground because that's how snow works. Snow falls from the sky, but it lands on the ground. Yeah, so we just leave it at grayscale, sample the colors. I'm just making us aware of some of the tools that are available in here. The default settings are good. As you hold the eyedropper tool down and move around, you'll get a sense of what you've selected or not. You may want to go back and do this a couple of times until you're satisfied with what you have selected. And you can adjust the fuzziness levels a little bit in the range, but this area tends to work okay. So that looks like I've got some snow selected there, the warmer areas. I have my original photograph selected, so that's the plan there. So now that's the selection range I have. I'm going to go over into here, and as soon as I click on there with a selection, that's the selection, a layer mask is automatically made. So I'm doing this on a brand new layer now. I needed to have my original layer uh, available to select from. And then I'm going to fill that selection with the foreground color of white. And now we want to make a layer mask out of that so we can go in and non-destructively make some changes. So with a selection made that's filled with white, we go down here into layer mask mode. We can make changes in our layer mask. So whatever was selected, because there's feathered edge and softness to it, we'll see black and white and shades of gray. So when I have black selected, I can remove content from the sky and I can keep that dark sky there. That's all I'm trying to do. I don't need any whiteness up in the sky. That happened to get selected with the initial selection filled with white. So I didn't need that. I just get rid of that. I was happy with the background, the original coloration, which is the darker stuff there. Okay, so there's my layer selected. I'll turn these off just so we can see what's going to happen here. So with that layer selected, go up into the menu bar and choose Select Color Range. There's the dialog box. Anywhere in this range is going to be just fine for what we're doing. Selection preview, none, grayscale. You can see what happens. None just leaves this unaffected. And then all we do is just settle for the default eyedropper tool. And that looks not bad. You can see as I hold my left mouse button down and I move the eyedropper tool around, I'm using some common sense and I'm placing the eyedropper tool on the ground because that's where the snow is going to apply. And that's what we're doing now, which is making selections for locations 
of snow to be placed. So that looks good enough to me. Okay, and then click OK. Good enough. Everybody's selections are going to look a little different than mine. And that's, that's great, that's not a problem. Okay. And then from there, we need to have the selection follow us to a new layer. And as long as you have something selected, it doesn't matter what layer you go to, that selection follows you to that new layer. But we want this selection to be on a brand new blank layer because it's going to have its own layer mask. So I'll create a new blank layer. There. Now you might see there that this is clipped to there, and that's fine. If we selected this layer to add our selection to, or we didn't clip this, we wouldn't have that clip there. But it's all good because we're only making changes on this layer anyway. So from there. I'm going to paint that with white. So over here in the toolbar area, we have these chips, there's foreground, background, you can see this foreground color, background color. We just want white. Here's a quick way just to get to white. This double click on there, that brings you to black and white. Make white the foreground color. And this time around, we'll go up into the menu bar and fill this way. We'll go edit, fill, our selection will be filled with the foreground color. That's it. Click OK. And you'll see something kind of like that. All we're doing is making a selection based on some tolerance settings. Here, I'll delete that. And I'll turn this off and just do that one more time. I'll go like that. Control D. So with that and nothing clipped, I'll do the same thing again. Select color range. That's good. So just making some kind of selection. These are the tolerance settings. We can make adjustments there. So if I think that's good, click OK. See, I have other things selected in there. Now I'll just create a new layer. That follows me along for the ride. If I go and get create a white foreground color. And then if I go up into the menu bar and choose edit, fill the foreground color with my select in my selection, that's what I'll end up with. And that's all I've done. Same thing that I did two minutes ago. Now with this selection active, when I click here, I'm creating that layer mask that we see over here. And we can go into this layer mask and non-destructively remove some of the white, make some changes. And people use layer masks all the time. See, and that's a little too intense. I don't want all that whiteness in the sky. So maybe I brush that out. So you can see combinations of, and what happens over here is, I end up making some adjustments with the opacity a little bit. It doesn't take long to sort out what one wants to do. So over here, with that thumbnail, not this one selected, but this thumbnail layer masking, I can go and start adding some color. Black is good. I want to brush, I mean, adding color. I'm going to create a hole in this mask and expose more of this dark sky. Right now I have that sort of fuzzed out a little bit, faded out because I still have some some of that uh, white fill is visible, that's all. So we want to get the paintbrush tool, just press B. And we're going to brush out. Remember black removes from our layer mask. So if I make a great big black brush. Oops. And I'll make that edge really soft. You can see how in my thumbnail, see if I can make these a little larger so you can see them. Let's see, how's that? 
you can see on that thumbnail, that's more solid black. And as I'm painting away, you can see how I'm exposing more of the background, the true actual colors in the mask. So that's much darker there. So I'm going to pretend I like that. That's the direction we're going. So from that to that. So I've got some ground coverage now that looks like that's where snow might be. And I would say relative to everything else we're doing with this particular image, that would be sort of the trickiest concept to grasp. You're just going to have to trust me for now that this is really, really common and you'll use layer masks a ton. So based on the selection we made here with the color range tool, clicking on all this warm tone material below here, we were able to come up with selection in that range. We filled that with white and then with the selection active, anytime you have a selection and you click on the layer mask tool, you're going to end up with a layer mask where you can go in and edit the mask. Black means invisible, white means visible. Anything in between is a grid, uh, gradation between visible and invisible in the mask. So all I'm doing here is revealing or covering up something that's in behind here. So blacks and whites and anything in between, those are all versions of putting holes in the mask. And then I'll adjust the opacity because that white looks a little too intense. So if I just click on this thumbnail and adjust the opacity a little bit, that might look a little bit better for what I'm doing. Or I click on the layer mask, Decide what looks best for you. You have to be aware of which thumbnail you're clicking on. Am I adjusting the, the abilities of the layer mask or am I adjusting the whiteness of the actual physical content? And then when I turn my hue and saturation layer back on and my color fill, it's looking a little snowier. So we've gone from that to that. Going from warm to cool with snow, we had to have some snow on the ground and we had to take the warmth out. So that's what the desaturation did, is take the warmth out of everything. The color range tool filling it with white creates the snow. And then the adjustment layer for color fill gives us a cool blue uh, tint over top of everything. And we'll make, take our copy here at the very end and we'll bring it up here and put a soft light on it. It just brings some of the integrity of the colored pixels back into play a little bit. But what we, and we can just take that copy and put it there, but we'll do that at the end. Before that, we'll go and make all of our snow. We'll create a blank layer at the very top. We'll fill it with white. We'll go up into the menu bar and choose filter noise. The noise filter has been around since the beginning of time. We'll create a black little Gaussian noise pattern. Pretend we're making the beginnings of some snow. We want monochromatic, just black and white. It's pretty messy. Then if we blur that a bit, it doesn't look like, it won't look like diamonds in space. We have softened edges on the snow. We're introducing ourselves to filters very simply. Yeah, so you can see what's happening here in the finished sample. And with an overlay blend mode, overlay is going to get rid of the black and let the white come through. Just like that. And without any motion blur, it looks like the snow is just kind of taking its own sweet time to come down to the ground. So we'll add some motion blur to that. Just pick something that looks like the snow's blowing. That looks a little more realistic. And then I duplicate the layer a few more times. And the top layers, I make each one a little bit larger, scale them up in size, so it looks as though there's snowflakes in the background, middle ground, and then foreground. 
And that's all that happens. And that's how we get to this. So we walk through the basic, some basic tools, but we actually create something instead of having super technical, I would say uh, more boring tasks to work on in order to experience what the tools do. So if I deselect and click on nothing, I'm going to grab this layer, click here, click new layer. It puts a new layer up here. I'm just going to go in here now and get the paint bucket tool or because that's a fill white already, or I can just choose edit, fill, foreground color. I just want white. So what you'll see is a big white out. You're in an avalanche. We'll go into the menu bar and choose filter, noise, add noise. Monochromatic, sure, that looks good for me. We want lots, so that's why I'm at 400%. Click OK, put the overlay blend mode on it. That's what you see. But it's, when you zoom in on that, <coughs> yeah, it's not very nice. See? So we want to soften that up. And that's where another standard filter, Gaussian blur, comes into play. And we can soften that up. When you click on a filter, hold your left mouse button and you can see the before and release, you can see the after. And around three pixels works just fine for me. So I'll click okay and pretend I like that. But I also want this to fall with a little bit of direction. So if I choose blur and motion back in the same location again, Sure, that, that looks okay. It's uh, that's a little better. Click OK. So conceptually, does this make reasonable sense, getting the direction we're going and the tools we're using? Good. Because we have to think about what our objective is. We're going from a warm scene to a cool scene. We want cool colors. We want snow. What are some of the simple tools we would work with? So we're using the tools to create this, but you can make lots of other uh, changes to other images. So I'll take this overlay. I'm going to zoom out here. I'll call it snow one. Or so I'll call it background. For background, why not? I'm going to take that, duplicate it here. If you hold the control key down, or just and then click on this thumbnail, everything gets selected. And just control T is a quick way to be able to select everything. You get these control arms and handles. And all I want to do now is scale this up. There, and I'll just move it a bit so the pixels don't overlap. Because now I'm going to create three layers of snow. Each layer is going to get closer to me. As they get closer, they would get larger. There, so I press enter after I scaled that up. Double click there and call it snow middle ground. Middle ground. There. I'll duplicate that layer. Scale it up. Enter. Snow foreground. And then I can adjust the opacity as I see fit. Snow in the background might not be as visible as the snow in the foreground. So I'm going from 40% background snow, middle ground, say 63%, foreground snow is 100%. There. So that looks like we have snow closer to us as well. If it's only that, smaller snow, you know, it looks like we're in the background a bit more. And then the last thing we did was take this layer,
and we brought it up into here. And put a soft light blending mode on it and adjusted the opacity because it just brings a tiny bit more life into our composition. So here this is placed above all these color treatments, but between the snow, we go into like a little overlay mode, but really drop the opacity down. There, so that's that image. It's invisible. When I make it visible, a little bit more intensity comes into the color areas because pixel for pixel, this lines up directly on top of that. There's a million different ways to work with the overlays. I'm just introducing this, and there's no technical one overlay that's going to work for you and your image. It depends on the colors overlapping other colors. But this is intended just to be an introduction to the existence of blending modes. So from all of that to this. And all those steps that are inside there, that is what is technically required for the project and here in the rubrics, Photoshop warm cool project, here again in the specs, anywhere from 72 dots per inch to 150, anywhere from 500 to 500 pixels or 500 to 2000, we can't make it any larger than 2000. It, we need to find a good outdoor picture. So what I would suggest is between now and next week, find a few photos you think would be eligible for use in this um, assignment. And then I can give you the thumbs up in class and you can go, yeah, that's good. That's okay, I'm good. I know I'm not wasting time working on something that's not going to make any sense. So we're looking for something that has a, an outdoor scene attached to it that is not primarily sky. We want lots of ground and mountain, something like that. We don't want a headshot of somebody in the tip of, a tent and then nothing but deep sky that's not going to work for us. So we're going to work with blending modes, adjustment layers, and proper selections. That's all this stuff. Layers, selections. Everything is non-destructively created and edited. That's what the adjustment layers are for. We're not flattening anything. This Photoshop file is what I'll see. It'll be sent. Uh, as an end of separate file. And that verifies that we're not flattening it and it will be sent. And this will be way too large to send as an unzipped email attachment. So this is something I can probably, this is something I, we can actually see in class and give feedback on and sign off on because this is very visual. It's very straightforward to see what the results and efforts are, but we'll tackle that cross that bridge when we get to it. So between now and next week, we need you good people to come up with some images, bring them to class some photographs that you think fit the bill for this project. So I've supplied these for practice. And that's where that came in. Another one, same thing. Is file open? Let's see, here's Women in the Water. Lots of warmish colors there. I take that, make a copy. Okay, here I'll do this in a slightly different sequence and go select color range. Sort of go there. Maybe here. Yeah, that's going to be a little bit better. Why not? Now I've got that selection. I can fill it with white. And I'll make a layer mask. And if I get the brush tool,
I can pull back some of the background there, just doing this very quickly. So maybe this is something that might work. And now we need to come here. Now we need to go over here and create an adjustment layer, hue and saturation, and desaturate all that. Create another adjustment layer, solid color. I've got some kind of blue. Maybe give that soft light, drop this down, something like that. Then make create a uh, blank layer where we can add a little bit of noise. I'm being, I'm not taking much time to make this look nice. I'm just showing you where the, how quickly you can go through this once you're familiar with where the tools are, but I'm not fine tuning or tweaking this by any stretch. Oh yeah, better fill out with white. And now you can see how large this is. Canvas size, it's huge. So 2000. And you'll get that happen sometimes. And that's because you have to go here. I'm just checking out the canvas size. So 2000. There. And you got a little bit of noise there, and I don't like that. It's not as fine grained as I would like, or it's coarse grained. So I'll do that again. There, that's a little coarser. And if I give that a little bit of a blur now, Do not freeze up on me there. Motion, that'll work. This time I'm putting all the different blurs in all at once. And now I can go over and apply these different overlay or blending modes. Scale it up. Copy it again. And take this, place it up there, give it a bit of a soft light, but really drop the opacity way down. Oh, yeah, that's just not going to work too much. Yeah, so won't use it for that one. Whoops, what happened there? I must have selected something to delete that. There we go. All right, that's better. But I can always go back in here into this layer mask now and make some changes in there because it's non-destructive editing. So if I get the brush tool, and instead of working with black, I work with white, I can fill that in very abruptly, of course, but you can see what's happening there. Well, that's the general direction we're going, gang. There. So that can become that. So hopefully, these little demos give you guys a sense of how these tools can be used based on the kind of image you're working with. And I would suggest you practice on these three images here. You've got them all. This way you can see the structure I put together. Some cases I have three layers of snow, others just two. Sometimes you might want to, depending on what you're doing, 
you might want two layers of the uh, color range selection area because it just makes more sense for the type of image you have. Duplicate that again. That's you know crazy amount of stuff. The experiment with the number of layers and explore the uh, the tools. You can always double click on the adjustment layer. Whoops, adjustment layer color fill brings up the property panel. Click on the color. If you need to change the color, hue and saturation, you can always. Go in and adjust those, get a feel for how the tools work, but we want to desaturate. That's what we're doing in this particular um, project. So it's, I think it's a good introduction to some need to know essential tools and features. And then you can compare the before and after to what your before and after looks like. Nobody's gonna have theirs looking exactly like these examples. It's impossible to mimic them completely. This is all about familiarizing ourselves with the selection tools a little layer of management and non-destructive editing working with adjustment layers. And that's what I wanted to show us today, gang. Hopefully I didn't go too quickly or too slowly for everybody. And what we'll do is next week in class, we'll pick up where we left off here, which is to say we'll uh, pick up next week is pretty much studio or lab time you guys can come to class show me your work ask me questions i'll review everything i just did in this particular um, demo but we're going to reapply this or these techniques and tools and features to your own personal image come to class with a few different images please and that way i can verify that one of them is going to be appropriate for this particular project definitely look for warm color warm color something with warm colors in it and you know what warm colors will look like because here's the color wheel. These are the warm colors that we're looking for that are be predominant in our photograph. So look for the warm tones. Don't come to class with something that's all dark greens, blues, and purples. That's not going to work. It's already in the cooler range. So did everything I mentioned today, guys, make some reasonable sense? Hopefully it was helpful. My, I'm concerned I'm torturing you guys to death and really going too slowly and I'm boring everybody. I don't want to do that. So are we clear on what the expectations are for next week? People can work on project two next week. You can work on any combination of whatever projects we have. You guys can wrap those up uh, and ask questions next week, get some in time in class, real time feedback. And that's where we'll get everybody on the same page before we move on to something new. But it's, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be doing something um, fresh every single week. What's this, can you know what we need to have for next week? Oh yeah, absolutely. So for Shasta, for this project, come back with a photograph or a few photographs that you think might work for this assignment. As I just mentioned, something warm tones and large too. We can't have something that's the size of a postage stamp. We're looking for in the range of 2000 by 2000 pixels. You guys can go and find something online if you'd like. That's not a problem. It doesn't have to be your own photograph. If you have one, awesome. If not, find something online. Here, go back here. So in weekly course modules, you'll see we have due week three or four. So you guys can still come to class next week with questions for projects two or three, grayscale and contrast interactions, and or even the um, RGB CMYK color system. And if people have those completely finished by next week, well, great. We'll just focus only on this, the new project. So for all you need for all you need for next week are just some photographs. And if there's any changes that anybody feels they want to make based on feedback for this project, then we can make those in real time in class and you can show me your changes and then I can I can uh, make a, a reevaluation. So we'll focus on all these projects right now before we jump into anything new. 
And I think that'll keep our hands full for a little while. We can see the due date for everything. It's clearly uh, labeled. And you guys should have all the reference material you could possibly use. Coupled with later on today and about five hours later this evening, once I get the fully processed uh, session for today's 160 group, I'll fire off that email to you. So you also have this session's recording. And uh, if it helps you, then fantastic. I would suggest maybe practice a little bit doing some basic selections if you want. Again, everybody's skill level with Photoshop, you know, could be all over the board. So do what works best for you and certainly feel free to cross-reference what you're going to do against these videos and work in real time with the videos. It's this video down here. Photoshop masking color range adjustment layers non-destructive. This is the one that walks you through the actual project. These are all tool-based demos. I think I'm going to, oops, not that, where are we here? Now, wherever that is, let's see. Oh yeah, I know, there. I'll stop sharing now. And I think we can probably wrap up unless there are any questions. I'll take that as we're ready to move. So you guys know the deal. Next week, Monday, I'll fire off another agenda email to everybody regarding what we're going to do for this class, which will be me repeating myself in type this time with, uh, with what I just said over the last five minutes. I'll do the same thing for the 120 class. 99% of us are taking both classes. And we can move forward from there. I have a bunch of marking between all five classes to get caught up on. So I will be marking more projects between now and clearly next class. If anybody based on what you saw in our 120 class and 160 class want to make any changes to anything, if you send me something, let me know in the email that it is a second attempt, it's version two and give your file an, another name, slightly different where you say version two, you know, include that in there somewhere as well. But wait for a little feedback, possibly if you're not sure. And you get to make, you don't, you get to make the revision after you've seen the feedback, not the time at which you've emailed me your work, but after I've been able to have time to go and put uh, some evaluation into Blackboard. Project two is an illustrator file, send that to me as an unzipped email attachment. Any Illustrator files, guys, just send those to me as unzipped email attachments. You don't have to bother packaging for the reasons I mentioned before, not the uh, Illustrator files. The InDesign files, they have to be packaged and zipped and sent through WeTransfer. You can't send zipped files as attachments and emails. So we're working on a few projects. Some are much smaller than others, but they all st string together in a logical sense. Any other questions, gang? If you can think of any between now and next class, you know, fire it off to me for sure. And I'll do my best to uh, respond as soon as I can. I just have to sit down and uh, work on marking a bunch of stuff. Yes, only the AI file, correct. Yeah, project one, two, and three, just Illustrator file. They're super small anyway. You won't even have to worry about anything with those. Just an unzipped email attachment is how I need your individual, uh, individual Illustrator file. Yeah, you guys, for what we're doing, will not need to do your pa any packaging for your Illustrator file. Just a single standalone Illustrator file is all I would need. Anything else, gang? Okay, I guess we'll wrap up. <coughs> Excuse me.
excuse me, if Brasha, if you've already sent me your file package, don't worry about it. Inside there's your Illustrator file and I'm good with that. You don't need to send it to me a second time, just separately. And I have a few people who have packaged up their Illustrator file and I understand why, because in the rubric, I said, send me your packaged Illustrator file. And with previous iterations of that project, there was a reason for us to package this up, but we don't have to for what we're doing. So if you've sent me something that's packaged, leave it as is, don't resend it again. You don't need to worry about that. And then over the next few days, I sh should be able to get around to putting some grades in Grade Center. And then you guys check out the feedback and see what you wanna do based on feedback, if there's any revisions required at all. Okay, gang, I'm going to stop the recording now. So thank every, uh, thanks to everybody for your participation and patience today. I know it's been a long day for you. And I can appreciate you've got a lot of things to do. Probably want to stand up and stretch your legs. So I'll fire off an agenda email before class next week on Monday and um, reiterating what our agenda is for next class. So, and what everybody needs to do, I think we're all clear. So take care. Have a great rest of the week, gang. And I'll be talking to you guys soon. So ciao for now. And I'll fire off the um, links to the session recordings later too. So take care, everyone. Ciao.